G'day brewers. In this video, we're going to find out if you can build a brewery from used dairy equipment, and more importantly, can you make decent beer from it? Let's get brewing. My name is Hendo, and I'm from Rockstar Brewer. I help brewers grow their business by making amazing high quality beer that builds brand loyalty and is fun to make. If you want to know more about that, hit me up on the website. And if you're new to this channel, please consider subscribing. So today we've got a really cool uh, episode uh, of the Rockstar Brewer channel. Um, I'm really stoked to have a chat with my good friends and my clients, uh, Peter Weldon and Luke Ronalds from Kurraman Valley Brewing. Um, the really interesting thing about these guys is that they have built their brewery um, on Peter's farm. We call him Smokey on Smokey's farm. And uh, they've done something really interesting with their brewing equipment. So what they've done is they've used upcycled dairy vats um, as a significant part of their brewery operation. Now you might be thinking, why, why would somebody do that? Um, and what, what, what would be the incentive for making that sort of design decision in a brewery? Uh, but as you'll find out in the interview, um, there were some particular constraints about the location of the brewery. Um, there were constraints about the amount of electricity on the site uh, and the fact that um, Smokey and Lukey have really strong focus on environmental sustainability. Uh, so this influenced their decisions uh, and made their brewery the way that it is today. Stick around to the end of the interview. After I wrap up the interview, uh, Smokey's actually going to take us on a tour of uh, his brewery where he's going to show us the waste oil burner, uh, he's going to show us their thermal fluid uh, heating system uh, and the brew house itself which is made from the upcycled dairy vat. So make sure you stick around the end. Uh, it's bloody hilarious basically. It's Friday night, we're having beers. So please enjoy this chat with Smokey and Lukey from Kurraman Valley Brewing. Cheers. Um, g'day everybody, uh, Hendo here from Rockstar Brewer. Um, today, uh, we're gonna talk about a really interesting topic. I get asked a lot about, got lots of questions about how to build a brewery and lots of people come to me with many different ways in which they can actually go and build a brewery. And today I'm joined by uh, Pete, Smokey Peterson, Weldon, and uh, Lukey Ronalds from Kurraman Valley Brewing. How you doing, fellas? Yeehaw! Yee <laughs> <laughs> no, so we're recording this on a Friday evening and we've all got beers. So cheers, boys. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> cheers. So, um, Smokey, why don't you tell us a little bit about Kurraman Valley Brewing and where you are located? Yeah, we're, we're, we're located on a picturesque property halfway up the Tomlin Mountain um, that's got a beautiful little spring and it's very soft water that feeds it. Um, we look down the valley towards the ocean, get the sea breeze. It's old banana farm and you know, 100 year old, well, over 100 year old um, ex banana land here. So, yeah. For, those, for yeah. those who are uh, uh, watching from not Australia, where, where would you be on the, on planet Earth? I, yeah, so we're <laughs> on the Queensland, New South Wales border. We we can walk over the border when it's not nineteen times. Um, yeah. The bay is there at the moment. I probably could find a place to cross over if I had to. Yeah. But, but yeah, basically we're right on the Queensland, New South Wales border, and about fifteen kilometres inland from the ocean. What was the uh, main reason for building your brewery? Uh, where where you built it? Uh, for me, it was buying the property was the spring was the number one reason that I wanted to. And also the fact that it's a farm. It's a pretty special spot to be here. But you know, having, having the access to the, um, the fruit and that sort of stuff here and obviously the water, which makes up most of the beer. Yeah, awesome. Um, and so the, when you say the farm, we're talking about your house basically, aren't we? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the brewery is literally 20 metres behind the house. So in, a, in two six by 12 metre sheds, it's, a, it's the old spring water facility. Um, so yeah, there's also three 10,000 gallon or 38,000 litre tanks um, that are, are there from the old operation of bottling yep. spring water. And stuff. Yeah, so we use that existing infrastructure um, for the brewery now. Yeah, awesome. 
And uh, Lukey, um, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the brewery itself um, uh, in terms of what sort of kit you've got and what your capacity is and that sort of thing. Well, the kit we've got, we actually decided to upcycle some old dairy vat equipment. So we have a 14 heck mash ton with a 20 heck kettle. It's uh, fired by a pretty cool little heating system. It's a thermal fluid system, which um, is fired by a, um, a waste oil system. So it's a little sort of burner that gives us 120 kilowatts of um, power through, um, yeah, burning used motor oil, basically. Yeah, right. So describe, um, you know, like I've been to lots of breweries that have been uh, either electric or they've been gas direct fired or steam or something like that. What's, um, what's thermal fluid? It's basically a sort of pretty much of a refined oil, which is, it keeps completely low pressure. So it's not, you don't have any of that steam regulations around dealing with high pressure steam systems. And I believe it's like, it used to be used like back in Germany, like years and years back before steam sort of really become popular. Like and in Germany? Yeah, there's right. sort of my understanding and then people sort of stopped, moved away from that because steam was like the, the bigger and better, newer thing. And I actually came across it from an article from a brewery in the UK, which was decommissioning their steam boiler and then replacing it with a thermal fluid system. Yeah, and right. it was one, one of the big steam companies. I don't remember what it was called. I think my full, full, yeah, it started with F. I can't remember that. Can, can I have a little, a little thing there though? Like for anyone that's thinking about using thermal fluid, one of the things I'm really concerned about now is that when you use all our thermal fluid system is, is mild steel. So all the, piping and everything, which then joins on to stainless steel. Anyone who knows anything about mild steel and stainless, the moment you get anything mild steel on the stainless, it becomes mild steel. So what that really means is the moment it oxidizes, it rusts. So I'm, I'm genuinely concerned. I think if, if we're gonna, if this anyway leads to people thinking that they should, this is a good way to go. If I had my time again, the thermal fluid heater would be built out of stainless. So you the, like all your, all your pipe work and that sort of thing? Or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Exactly. I'm concerned yeah. that it's contaminating the jackets of our, um, of our kettle and our uh, hot liquor ton. So, uh, yeah, right. so I'm buffing. When, when we empty them, I, I generally jump in and buff out a bit of the rust here and there that's coming through. We don't really know if it's coming from, from the inside out, but I've, I've got, look, all I can say is, is if you're going to do it, See if you can get a stainless steel or thermal or mild steel yeah, one. Yeah, right. Okay. So it sounds to me like the way that I kind of think about the thermal fluid system is it sounds like a hot glycol instead of a cold glycol. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, so you don't have the, the high pressure um, and therefore you don't have the, um, uh, the, the regulatory requirements around running sort of a high pressure boiler and all the pipe work and all that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a much safer option it's probably also more cheaper to implement as well would that be fair to say yeah definitely it's um i think pretty much standard well here would about 60 plus thousand to get a steam system in and get that fully commissioned mm. i think the, the thermal fluid system cost us a little bit over twelve thousand, but i think like pretty much like pete was saying if we had have known what we know now we probably would have spent a little bit more money and got that stainless pipe work because it has like a through through the system where it has the boiler or, or the actual jet firing through it it's got like a triple pipe system where it passes the thermal through fluid yep. through yep. twice so it um like if that was all made out of that you know stainless pipe work i think we would add a lot a lot more better but i'd yeah be, I'd, it'd be interesting to see how much the cost would have changed from that yeah. point of view. It hasn't all been 
like as easy going. Luke can elaborate more on yeah. what it costs and stuff to do it. And we got away with it fairly cheaply, but there's been a few little hiccups here and there. A few little pitfalls there. So um, it sounds like, you know, the thermal fluid had some advantages with regards to lower, lower costs, you know, lower capital yeah. costs and that sort of thing. Um, what's the energy source for the thermal fluid? What actually heats it? What's the waste oil burner? Yeah. So That's, describe yeah. that to me. Do you want to do that, Luke, or will I? Oh, you can do it. You've yeah, done. so it's basically... <laughs> yeah. so, so there's, there's a compressor that blasts in, like, obviously, high-pressure air, which then atomizes, like, a preheated waste oil source. So it heats it to basically 90 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. But it heats it to 90 degrees Celsius, and then... Um, that's fed through with a big kind of fan behind it, like almost like a hand dryer or a, a hair dryer. Yeah. And that's, that fan is what shoots the flame. So if you imagine the oil's getting pushed in, there's two little, uh, um, if that's the oil feed, there's two little um, sparks or arc part points that arc a, a thing across. The pressure atomizes the waste oil the arc of the electricity is what ignites it and then the fan behind it blows the length of the fan uh, of the right. fire sorry. so if you imagine then that the in the in the pit where the fire is it's like a big cylindrical thing it looks almost looks like a train like a old locomotive so we call it thomas the tank engine it's basically a coil and that's full of thermal fluid and the flame is shooting down the middle of that and that's cycled by the pumps and the the sensors to measure the temperature. So all all that happens is we're basically it's like on a thermostat, if you would, when it's heated up to where it needs to be, it t it turns the flame off, and then when it drops, it it turns back on. So yeah, right. Pretty much. How so <clears throat> so that's um that's pretty interesting. So so you're telling me that this burner burns waste oil. Where do you get your waste oil from? <laughs> well, we started. We started off with with me um, going down to local mechanics. Um, you know, Crum Crumman's actually perfect for it in Crumman Waters. There's, there's a lot of mechanics down there, so I was able. We just bought like a seventy dollar hand hand pump thing that, that screwed into the top of like. So a, you're talking. You're, so you're talking engines, used engine sump oil, basically. Exactly, yeah. So um, originally I'd go down and pump, you know, 240 litres at a time into 20 litre drums and in the back of the van drive them back up. But uh, when after about a year of operation, um, you know, just making sure it fit in there in everything, Lukey um, found a 1,000 litre IBC that we could get for a reasonable price. And um, at that point we could afford it. But it, when you consider that we were taking oil for free to power the brewery, and now we're yeah. looking at paying what was it? It's about fifty cents a liter, I think. So, yeah. Right. yeah. So, yeah, so burning burning uh, waste oil, Lukey, that doesn't sound very environmentally friendly, is it? Yeah, it um, actually is fairly environmentally friendly. It's it comes in at a Euro three standard emission standard, so mm. it's uh, which is you know f fairly well on the um, on that sort of. Scales for all the greenies out there, like. Oh, well, you certainly wouldn't want to. You, <laughs> <said, laughs> you certainly wouldn't want to. Um, uh, it's a beautiful area up there in the Karuma Valley. You certainly wouldn't want to be um, damaging the local environment. That's something I know Smokey holds that very dearly. Yeah, um, definitely. Just, and uh, when, when it's burning, actually, very clean. You can. It, it's there's not very many emissions. Like it is, it does burn very, very nicely. Yeah, all you see is yeah. the convection. You, yeah. you don't see any smoke. It's it's yeah. pretty awesome to watch, to be fair. It took yeah. us a little bit to dial that in, and, and every time we um, service the waste oil burner, we, we pull it apart and, and retest it. So, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. We, we're making sure we're doing everything the best we can. I mean, there's solar on the roof of the house too that offsets the electricity. So in terms of the heating and that adding into things like – our bills for electricity for heating the brewery are comparably really like probably a quarter of what a brewery our size would be if it was on electricity or steam. Yeah, right. So it sounds like you're very uh, self-sufficient with regards to uh, energy. What was the main reason for doing that? So, for, so, my, so my, I, guess, I guess to phrase it another way, 
you've got this thermal fluid. It's powered by, uh, you know, like waste oil, uh, waste oil and that sort of thing. Um, you know, uh, Smokey, what was the sort of reason for being so self-sufficient and not, say, building a gas-fired uh, brewery or an electric <laughs> brewery and that sort of thing? Well, I think that comes back to pricing. So we looked at electricity. We've, we've got three phase here, but we just don't have enough. And when I approached Energex about it, they wanted an exorbitant amount of money, which I thought was silly because we're really going to be paying them a lot more. But either way, they wanted a lot of money just to put it there. And if they wanted that transformer anywhere else, they could just take it, they said, to use it anywhere else. So it was just, it didn't feel like it was going to be a solid solution. Um, and then um, steam has all the compliance issues, gas as well. It's more trucks. Um, having a huge gas cylinder, you know, 20 to 30 metres away from my bedroom where I sleep every night was, a, was something that rang in my head, like if there was an issue or something. Uh, even running out of gas was kind of a bit of a problem as well. Like, yeah. I think the thermal fluid like, resounded and waste oil burner resounded well. With, with Luke and I, we just thought that was the right thing to do. Yeah, right. Okay. And so um, in your brew house itself, <clears throat> how many vessels is your brew house? And uh, Luke, you were saying before, there's like a, a, a 1,400 litre mash, ton, and yep. how big was the kettle? Uh, it's two, two, 20 hacks at 2,000 litres. We don't ever really push it to that level. It was just basically because we're... Well, upcycling the dairy vat equipment, that was sort of what we fell into. So yeah. we'll probably wish the mash tun was, or mash louder tun was a little bit bigger. We <laughs> might, yeah. might try and get a bigger one, I think. It, like, yeah. you know, it served its purpose, what, that one, but reality is it is a limitation at the moment. For We, we push that, <laughs> we push that grist to water ratio, water grist ratio pretty pretty thick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we've been able to um, drop, we've lost <laughs> glasses here and there early on in the mashing, but um, when we talk about mash paddles, we can rest like mash paddles on top of the mash, it, like for stouts and, and uh, neepers, we've done it before for brekkie juice. Um, yeah, and we've we've uh, popped welds on our ladder plates as well. So we've definitely <laughs> pushed, it, pushed it as hard as it can go. So, Lukey, what was the reason for going with um, upcycled dairy equipment? Uh, basically, I think pretty much sort of the cost basis of the whole build. So we had bought all of the cold side cellar stuff from China. I was thinking of buying a a brewery on a skid we were fairly limited on budget and i think every brewery build goes over budget completely mm. i think so in in hindsight i really think we'd made the right call on doing the the upside of brewery vats because it even like we had to do a lot of work and smoky was fortunate he actually had worked for a stainless steel fabrication company before so he, I had a couple of his mates sort of organising like the welding around like modifying those vessels. So it's, yeah, from, from my from my side, I think sort of the cost, like I think in hindsight, I would have liked to have something a little bit more smoother, but I mean, it's done the job. We've made some really good beers, you know, gold medal beers and some award winning beers from that little system. And it's, yeah, I think it's, you know, well, I think they say, you know, it's more about the process than the fancy equipment you're working with. Yeah. Really. Yeah. So, so, so you you so basically your work production, your hot sides, all upcycled equipment. What? Yeah. What have you? You're not fermenting in milk vats, are you? No, no. So it's all. We're of thinking us. about it. We're thinking about. <laughs> it. Yeah. Well, I I I did pick up some really really cheap um, vats that we're probably going to put some wild owls and stuff through. So. Yeah. Right. Might see all those up and see how that goes. But, um, yeah, Ma main thing is all of, like, so we've got the mash, louder, kettle, we've got the cold liquor ton and then a hot liquor ton as well. That's all upcycled dairy vat equipment. Yeah, and uh, so all your fermentation vessels are... Yeah, all, all, all the fermentation, all, all the fermentation. So we've got the two, two fermenters, the two brights, and so that's all stuff we 
like imported from China. We yeah, we right. plan those brights in the uni tanks now though with the customer of racking arm. Yeah, so we've yes. even even modified those. <laughs> yeah, right. Nothing safe. From... <laughs> <laughs> Nothing safe. <laughs> we'll, we'll mess with him. I think also it's fair to say, like you know, like Luke, he probably won't won't blow his own trumpet, but he did a really good job managing that that budget and the build. Really, really good job and got us, you know, to the point where where we could. Um, make beer well and also you too Hendo like uh, October before we even started the build we did that trip with you down to Melbourne and and um, had a look around at various setups and that was really where we felt confident that you could use a dairy vat system seeing Tallboy and Moose and, and seeing Seven Cent Brewery that with you that really like made us feel like oh this can be done it's not just yeah. uh, half assed and trying to save money it's like you, you legit can do this so yeah, How good were those breweries, though? Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. Dan Hall does a great job down there. And those seven cent boys, they're awesome, you know? So many barrels. I, <laughs> I, I think that's the thing, though. It's just like, even for the cold side, I feel like I like messed up that a little bit by doing the two brights and the two unis, uni tanks, fermenters. So, like, I just think, like, we weren't really sort of experienced. Well, I wasn't really experienced when I was buying or, or getting quotes on that sort of thing. So I think it's good to, you know, get some consulting sort of done. Like, I mean, I think if we had to discuss that with you a little bit more on the cold side, you would have probably, you know, helped us out a bit with that. And if by just, consulting you, know, you, you mean us hanging out and having beers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just, if we had that told you, if it, it, yeah, if we if we if we had if we have told you what we were doing, we probably wouldn't have made <laughs> a couple of gone. mistakes. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm glad you did it. I'm glad you did it yourselves, anyways, because it was like you know, some things you just got to figure out for yourself and that sort of thing. And yeah, that's, that's to yeah. be fair, though, like the original setup was is we were going to do like one third clean beers, one third fast sours, and one third like barrel aged beers, and. The, the reason we got, or the reason Luke decided to get the two um, brights was so we had one for clean beers and one for the, like, for fruiting and, and for carbonating the barrel aged beers. So there was, yeah. it wasn't just shooting into the breeze loosely. There, there was some real thought that went into it. And it's just the way the business operated and, you know, where we've ended it up that's kind of made it that we needed the four uni tanks, really. Um, but, you know, Luke wasn't to know that at the start and neither was I or neither were I. And, and I just, you know, we, we talked about long and hard about what we thought we needed and we made that call. So, yeah, it was a, it was a joint decision. And I think at the end of the day, you, you'd never really know how business is going to go yeah. from the start. And, and I think we did pretty well with what we had. I, I think so, you, so your business, so what you're saying is, you, is your, your business model really dictated the, the tanks that you got and then when you actually got up and running that it didn't go according to plan but it still worked out anyways yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it, no i think that that's like we had we had a plan what we were going to do with that like like Pete was saying with like doing the one third like the clean beers and then barrel aid stuff and then the fast sours and it just you know we ended up having to brew a lot more clean beers just to keep up with demand. So it was just mm -hmm. like, that was bringing in the money at the time. So that's sort of where you go. And then sort of the whole Gabs win completely changed everything. We saw yeah. at the So I, so I yeah. wanted to touch on that, but at first I want to get another beer. Can I get another beer? Yes. Yep. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> You have to edit it out here now, or what? Yeah. I'm <laughs> oh, sweet. So we can't say things like bum and. <laughs> well, now you can. <laughs> <laughs> what are you drinking there, Pete? This is local. Look how clear it is. Holy smokes, man! It's cleaned right up. How's the XBA that you were you put up in the grog dogs? <laughs> it was good. Really. Good. Yeah, it's really good, man. It, well. it was just one can and it was there on its own like last Friday. So you know how it's that psychological thing for people? If they see one can, they're like, what's wrong with that beer? Yeah. So 
So I just got myself another beer and I've got myself this uh, Karam Valley. Funnily enough, it's called Waste Oil. There you go. And uh, so I can crack Almost this right now. Almost yeah, to uh, trials and tribulations with Waste Oil. To trials and tribulations. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a, it's a good style. I love this beer. Thanks. I'm pretty happy with Cheers, it. legends. <laughs> so <clears throat> if you could... Um, so, Lukey, it seems like you played the the role of being sort of like the the brewery engineer sort of thing in in this particular uh, brewery build. Um, what if you could list sort of say two or three problems with going down the route of doing um, thermal fluid, waste oil, upcycled dairy vats? What do you think they would be now that your brewery is up and running? Um, oh, that's a tough question. I think I, did, I didn't really have any problems ordering any of the stuff from China on the cold side, so any, any of the uni tanks and the brights. Like I think that went fairly smoothly. I think possibly the getting the thermal fluid system installed was probably a little bit, over our heads or over how, my head. So? I just do. So we kind of bought the system, got it like sort of, it was being manufactured and stuff. And like, I didn't have any one that had that expertise on how it needed to be set up. So I spent quite a bit of time researching how you're going to commission one of these thing, one of these systems and that. And um, yeah, so that, I think that was sort of fairly like, you know, a bit of an unknown at the time, but I mean, it ended up working out okay in the end. Like we didn't yeah. really have any problems, problems with it. Um, I think from a, from an actual brewing perspective, it's a little bit like I'd like to have a dedicated whirlpool ton just so we could, move beer where it's yeah. colder and like it, you don't have that thermal fluid compared to steam where you've got something which will easily cool down a little. Like Talking like, about like carryover heat and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you've got th a lot of thermal fluid sitting around in the jackets, which is a little bit harder to cool over whereas you just can pump it across into a whirlpool tonne. I think you're going to have a lot. And get it off the heat sort of thing. And yeah, get, get it off the heat. and yeah, Especially if you're going to brew stuff like Neepers and that sort of thing. Like, yeah, um, absolutely. You don't want any of where that. You, where you want to do something like a cold, cold whirlpool or... Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, yeah, I think, yeah, it's... it's it's a the way burn has been a pain service-wise too, Lukey. Like, yeah. You don't really do it, but for me it's like... It, it, it like running it on the day is pretty labor intensive like and it it's not automated so we're running outside to turn on jackets like to turn on the, the flow in the jackets and to shut them off for others and like making sure it's not like the waste oil burner is not cutting out and so like really yeah. it's both of us there looking after it on the day so we need to make sure the compressor is running to make sure that like the waste oil burner is doing its thing and the thermal fluid is doing its thing. So the actual heating side of the brewery is super labor intensive. And then the servicing mm. of it is a hot job. Like you know, burn ring, it um, gets filled up with what I would assume is highly carcinogenic burnt oil kind of thing. And it's, yeah, it's not nice to have to clean that. And um, yeah, the whole process, like degreasing everything, it, it's messy. It, like oil leaks, it gets everywhere. It's it's one of those things you need to think about if you're going to do this. So, like, yeah. you can plug anything into that thermal fluid heater. Hey, Luke, you, like, you, you can put um, gas into it as well. Or um, yeah. So that's another thing to keep in mind. But, yeah, I think that's relevant to the question you were asking. Yeah. So yeah. Um, when you have to get in there and clean it, do you come out looking like the fucking chimney sweep from Mary Poppins or what? <laughs> I would say that, like, from a silicosis point of view, you'd want to, like, it's really important to wear have some PPE? sort of... Yeah, definitely have that all sorted. Like, you want stuff over your eyes, stuff over your mouth. I mean, in gloves too. 
Um, it, it's it's not good gear you're working with. There's just going to be heavy metals. There's going to be stuff that's going to be bad for your lungs, and you want to make sure that it's it's a necessary task. And probably, uh, it's, okay. If we if the brewery's full tilt, we you might have to clean it once every two weeks. So that's the manufacturer would probably say what Lee you like once every three months or something, but it's yeah. definitely more. And at first I thought that was like from impurities from the waste oil itself. But once we started buying stuff that was good too, it's, it's really not, it's just, there's a little bit of coolant. There's a bit of water in all of the oil that you buy, no matter how refined it is when it's waste oil. So yeah, yeah. there's shit, unfortunately, that just kind <laughs> of in there. Yeah. I think I, I, yeah, I think it's fair to say like it's just like we were we originally did plan to have an electrical fired brewery. And it's just we like Pete was saying earlier, we didn't have like it was gonna cost us a fortune to upgrade the transformer out there. We didn't have option to have gas or anything. So it's like it's basically the property is pretty much off the grid, would you say, Pete? Like I oh, pretty close to it. Yeah, it's get, that would be my dream if I could afford it. But the reality is, is we we do have three phase power up there. What is yeah. this? Like Twenty eight kilowatts or something. It's not. It's yeah, not any record. So so basically, saying the constraint is is that you've got electricity going up there. It's three phase, but it's not enough amps in order to run a full yeah. electric brewery. Yeah, and and so the electric company basically said to you, "Well, we can put the electricity up here, but we're going to charge you." an extortionate amount of money for a transformer and you don't own it when we install it. Yeah, that's right. So that was a yeah. huge problem. That was a massive problem. Mm. And like Luke is like, he's different to me. He looks at problems go, and goes, right, where are the solutions? And I look at it and go, ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's why we work well together. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Anyway. So if you've got a brew house that, that, um, you know, is is made from upcycled brewing equipment, you know, dairy vats and that sort of thing. Yeah. Can it make decent beer? It can, but I was going to say, and, and and you're right on track, was that the actual fabrication of the, the false bottom or, or the louder plates and stuff was, was also a bit of a mission. And that comes down to the bottom of the dairy vats where you weld the curve in is polished out. So it means that the steel there is very thin. So you need to weld what the, we welded in like, I think it was 20 by five mil yeah. um, uh, stainless flat bar right around for, for that to then rest on top of another 20 by five stainless, stainless steel flat bar with the ladder plate in it. So at the end of the day, we've got 40 mil there um, to the top of the ladder plate, which means we've got 290 litres of, of dead space in, in the bottom of a... Under the plates. Sort of heck, yeah. Um, uh, mash ton, mash ladder ton. So if we were to do it again, we probably would have made that initial resting plate, maybe like 10, 10 by 5 mil or... Something that, you know, because you, you can't weld on to the thin part where it's polished out because you start blowing holes through the jacket with the welder and stuff. So you need to get right up above that. And then, so, yeah, ultimately the biggest problem with our uh, mash ton at the moment is definitely the dead space that we have. And that's why we're doing these really thick uh, mashes. To, yeah, to right. Make, you I, still didn't answer your fucking question, though. Can oh, it make oh, decent beer? Jeez, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, apparently, um, yeah, we don't go too badly. We, we did all right. Go on, don't be shy. To give us the fucking rundown of your achievements. Well, well, we, well, obviously, um, the great bubblegum sour won Gab's People's Choice, which was pretty, pretty fun. But um, yeah, we did all right. We what XPA got our <laughs> Crumbins Independent XPA had a bit of a bigger fault of fun because we're mates for them. But um, it, it got a gold and, and um, what else did Lee? I'm trying to, I need to look at the picture. Beer Rocker did. Um, yeah, our, our lawsuit did. Well, oh, I had one of those last night. <laughs> it was bloody good. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and what else? Uh, the Brett Saison picked up a silver, as did local. 
our powwow, and then um, the stout got a bronze, which I think was a little harsh. I think it's better than the bronze, but anyway, that's mm. me. And and uh, what was the other one? Gra- uh, the great bubblegum sour. Great bubblegum sour. I think got a got yeah. a medal as well. Yeah, yeah. I think bronze yeah. was it? Yeah. 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 So so, Lukey, how, how do you make good beer on upcycle dairy equipment? Well, we asked Smokey about that. He's, oh, okay. Let's ask him. <laughs> He's a man making a good beer, on it? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it comes into a lot of... I thought Smokey like, just stood out the back and operated the fucking waste oil burner or something. No. Nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we all have goes at that, mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty interesting brew day. We run around a lot. Yeah, um, yeah look. I can't even remember the question. <laughs> how do you make how do you make good beer on upcycled dairy equipment? Uh, I don't think there's much to. What's your secret? You Making need to give people a secret. Good kit. Well, it's it's just making sure you're really cellaring, you're keeping keeping um all of your data and stuff, and just trying to make beer well consistently, hitting hitting your numbers and. Yeah, just really making sure we're not letting too much oxygen in and, and being clean, you know. <laughs> Is there much more to it than that? Like, as far as I'm concerned, that's that's what we focus on. Quality is number one. And, um, yeah. yeah, we and learning is number, number 1.5. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah we, go, we go pretty hard on both of those things. Um, and, and also ha- having fun, um, for me... Luke's taught me a lot about keeping cool. I'm very reactive and Luke's very just like, wait a minute, <laughs> let's, let's work this out and breathe a tick. And um, I feel sorry for him a bit that uh, having to deal with me, but I, I'm really loving it. So it's not just me. Luke and I both get the job done. It, that's, that's how it works. Sounds like a good team effort. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So what's your future plans? That's Luke. Oh, well... We were pretty close to signing up or making an offer on a lease and expanding because basically where we are up on Pete's property, we don't have a tap room or anything. So from that was the natural progression was to open up a second site possibly and pretty much we had decided to move the brew house to the tap room location and... um go from there and um yeah all of so this. recent circumstances changed that for now yeah for now I, i'm i'm still hopeful we'll have that happen by the end of the year so i might be delusional with that but no i think i think yeah, uh, I think uh, again luke's being a bit humble he, he's always on to it in terms of steering the business and looking after stuff and um particularly finance financially massively so um, obviously we got a big scare when all this stuff started breaking out, but yeah. um, as Luke's pointed out to me, it's not a bad time to really be negotiating hard on leases and we'd probably get more in the current environment um, than we would. Thank you, Celia. <laughs> Daniel's just popped in with some food for me. Um, than, <laughs> than we would in, the, in a normal scenario. So, um, yeah, it's, so it's, it's really just become a bit of a wait and see thing for you now, yeah? Yeah, basically, I'm still trying to push ahead. Like, we're sort of working out some of the planning, like how we're going to lay out the whole... We, we have a site in mind and we're going to try work out how we're going to lay that out and everything and, you know, bring in the tap work, in, tap work or tap house into the mix. Is um, We don't have experience with that. Like, I mean, I don't have a lot of hospitality experience, so that's a whole whole new ball game. So, um, yeah, we're working out that and just planning and making some smart decisions around how we're going to do that. Because, I mean, yeah. up until now, it's just me and Pete running the whole brewery. And, and you don't have a, uh, a tap room now and, and the brewery's not open to visitors, so how do people buy your beer? Luke? Yeah, well, that was... When we originally started out, we were just doing the wholesale market. So just doing kegs to venues and sort of we worked out, I don't know if we we worked it out, but 
picking up the gabs people's choice we sort of realized when that happened we've got to put beers in cans and just get them do the direct to consumer thing so selling from our website the website's still an awesome you know source of getting cash flow into the business so we get paid two days after someone buys on the website so it's what is the uh, where, what is the, which website is this you talking about? It's karamanvalleybrewing.com.au. Uh-huh. Nice <laughs> Please put that on the screen though, Hendo. Like, yeah, yeah, I can do like all flashy shit and that sort of yeah. thing. The main thing is, is like Karaman is the most, Karaman Valley is the longest friggin' name that no one unless, you know, no one unless you're Australian is really going to have a clue how to spell that. Yeah, <laughs> but would you, would you be anywhere else though? Hell no, not me. Nah. It's bloody <laughs> beautiful up there. So um, hopefully over the course of this, we'll have uh, overlaid a little bit of video from Smokey uh, on what the uh, what the brewery looks like. We may do a bit of a guided tour after this and that sort of thing. It'd be really cool. Um, Can but, we read um, back to the, um, the forklift? Um, no, I just... <laughs> what I did want to say, though, was that it's not that we don't want to have a tap room here. We, like, I actually really would like to have a tap room here, but the reality is, is, is there's a couple of things that make that difficult. That is outlined on the website. But to sum it up really quickly, number one, it's a 500 metre one-way driveway up a very steep hill. So what that one way means is, is that traffic going down town has a right way because reversing up a hill is actually physically very hard for a lot of cars particularly in the wet so you have to give way to the vehicles coming down so if you're coming here for the first time as a visitor you want to drive up a hill it's really challenging anyway and then suddenly you meet another car in the driveway and you've got to reverse all the way down that's that's just a big problem for everyone involved the driveway is also shared with my neighbors so that's the next thing that's the issue so that makes it really hard for them as well. They don't want to have people coming past their little patch of paradise that they've bought for their own privacy. And we respect that too. And ultimately, I think a lot of those things have been played into the fact that the council, the Gold Coast City Council, didn't let us in our development approval um, have a tap room. And then ultimately, number one, I think I was going to hate me for saying this, but my partner also didn't want us to have um, strangers coming up here to drink beer at basically my house or our house. So, um, yeah, so all those things play into why we couldn't have a tap room and tap rooms mean retail margin for a business like, like a brewery. And um, we're very fortunate that Luke was able to set up another means through the online store, which he's done all on his own, um, to, to really get the retail margin into the business. And I would think that it wouldn't work at all. We would have hung up at this point if, if it wasn't for that. So. Yeah, it's well worth noting that you can't wholesale <laughs> kegs with a very tiny brewery. Don't do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, for everyone who's out there uh, watching or listening, uh, I do highly recommend you head to Karaman, is it karamanvalleybrewing.com.au? Yeah. Uh, and uh, go and grab yourself a bit of a care package. I got one delivered uh, yesterday. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm super grateful for it. It's stuck in my bunch of house. <laughs> And I've got delicious beer, so I'm really happy. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, Smokey, Lukey, thanks heaps for your time uh, this wonderful Friday evening. Um, I wish you all the best in the future and um, uh, keep making awesome beer. Cheers. Yeah, thanks, mate. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers to mate. you too. Oh, look. Oh, there you go. <laughs> 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 G'day. I'm Smokey Pete. Welcome to... Crumman Valley Brewing. Uh, you're in the middle of a proper brew day as it happens. So um, I'm gonna take you for a little walk around, check it out. Uh, the brewery is running at the moment. We're midway through a brew day, just waiting for the kettle to come to the boil. I've got my glasses on. PPE is always the way forward, safety's a go. Um, so what you're gonna see is not the cleanest side of the brewery. I mean, obviously I'm out here now walking in on the grass, so I'm walking there with dirt on my feet. Right anyway, rah, but and also, you know, it's kind of ramshackle because we got these kegs and now we don't really need them, and uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, yeah, so I'm Smokey Pete, as you know. Uh, you can take, and I'm eating my lunch at the same time, which is an apple brunch, I should say. No breakfast for, for me, nice healthy start. So, 
yeah, let's kick it off there and I'm gonna spin this around and you can see. All right, so what we're looking at now is kind of the operating power plant of the brewery. Uh, the vessel at the front closest to me is the cold liquor ton and the tower up the back that has the two big white things in it with the solar hot water is the glycol tower. That's refrigeration for this. The next part is a hot liquor ton. Uh, you can see, and the waste oil burner plugged in there. See where that orange cord's going? That's the waste oil burner, and it's plugged into the thermal fluid heater here. It's gonna be a little hard to hear, but I'll just give you a look at it. Basically inside that green part is a, a coil with the flame of the waste oil burner shooting down it. That uh, pump, you can see spinning in the middle right corner of the thing there, is pumping the thermal fluid around that coil as the heater goes through it. Um, any flame or stuff in the flame is coming out the chimney up there. You can see it's basically, that's Euro level three emissions, that is burning clear. So we've got, well I've got it dialed in, so it's not bug rising around. Um, yeah, that's basically it. And I don't know if you can see it probably, but on the other side of the hot liquor ton is the, the IBC full of waste oil. So I used to hand pump 20 litre containers of that. Do you mind Cheeky? Come on, mate. I'll let them out when we're not brewing. They're normally free-range birds, but not at the moment. Uh, and our keg washer that we got from Black Ops, it's their old one. We've actually upgraded the elements in it and tweaked a few things to get it to work for us. Uh, it washes two kegs at a time. It's very, very manual. Nothing's automated. There's all the levers. We had to buy new valves. Uh, the old ones are pretty stuffed. Uh, here's our mill. State-of-the-art Tiantai Chinese piece of kit. Uh, that 30 litre keg fits perfectly in there, otherwise my chickens roost on it. So um, that's there to stop them doing that. Uh, there's also uh, carbon dioxide there and a fire extinguisher in case we need it for any reason, especially around a mill, that's very flammable. Don't smoke and mill. Uh, righto, let's go for another walk. Okay, this is like the storage side of the brewery here. Yeah, we've got an on-site cold room, it doesn't hold a lot, it's mostly yeast and hops and um, then just some cans uh, and a few other bits and pieces of things that we need. Uh, there's also a heap, of, a heap of boxes for the canning. So what we sold, they go back there. So we're just about ready to start canning again. Um, and then the rest of it's sort of like my tool shed for, for the farm. So my tractor and a lot of my gear. So that's that. Boom, the old Kubota. So I've, uh, this is now the, the, all our bats, a whole four of them and our CIP unit. Luke is cleaning the tanks today. I did them yesterday. We're brewing in tank one. He's cleaning tank two and three today, hopefully. All things going well. Uh, with the current restrictions uh, on kegs, we're making two, we're doing a double batch of sours, hopefully, tomorrow. I'm gonna run that and hope to fill those two tanks. Um, our dairy vats are uh, upcycled, sorry, our, our brew house is a two vessel upcycled dairy vat system, um, which is in, in operation at the moment, so. Um, unfortunately, my my sparge arm setup's just fallen down. But basically, how it works, which is pretty funny, just mind my apple, is that sits on there like so, and um, and sprays the water out over the top of the mash bed. Uh, there's our grain in there. I'm about to shovel it out, but I thought I'd take this video just before I did, and to show you the louder plates, um, I scraped a bit of it out of the way. They're basically what's called wedge tech. We cut them in four pizza-sized shapes to stick them in there, and they're up and going. Uh, the kettle is here, it's a 24 heck kettle, um, or old dairy vat. Uh, what else is going on? Sorry, leave them in your way, I'll just get this done. Um, yeah, so there's a heat exchange in the middle. We custom built all that piping, just to make sure that um, we can make this brewery operate. Uh, I'm not gonna open the lid on this because we're heating up some uh, lacto starter mix there. Um, before we pitch the lacto in it. But um, this is getting ready to, to boil, I would assume. So yeah, but that at the moment that's pretty full of wort. It's 1500 liters of wort in there, it's gonna be XPA. Uh, a bit of lab stuff here, uh, bin, you know, beer, all sorts of stuff happening here. I'll be swinging around and look down the back now. Um, see Lukey still working hard like a champion. Um, and then basically our lab bench and a little tiny bit of storage. I mean, we're extremely limited with our space in here now. Uh, we've got grain, our bottling lines up the back, uh, and then this sort of open bag. So 
some shirts there on the ground. Heaps of uh, gas bottles stored. Yeah, there's there's really not a lot of space left in here for us, but we've done the best we can. Phew. It's messy, but we're in the middle of a brew day. Rock on. All right, I hope that gives you a good idea of how our brewery's operating. Uh, it's a pretty special setup. There's solar on the roof too. I could probably show you that as well, but maybe another time. But yeah, basically, uh, we're running a fairly sustainable operation. Thanks for checking in and checking it out. Don't spend too much time looking at our floor. It's going to be fixed soon. <laughs>